So hi, my name's Ace. I'm a developer programs engineer here at Google Cloud. And today, we're going to be talking about releasing with confidence. So testing, debugging, and monitoring in a serverless world. So our agenda for today. First off, we're going to talk about testing, what it is, how we do it, why we do it, just kind of as an explanation of the context of this slide or this presentation. Then we're going to take that knowledge and wrap it up in the world of functions as a service. Third, we're going to talk about how to automate this process using uh, CI, CD, or continuous integration and deployment platforms. And fourth, we're going to talk a little bit about the operations of functions. So first, a quick background on testing. Testing can be defined as sort of two separate things. So we're asking two high-level questions here. First of all, does our code work in the first place? And second of all, does our code work well? So lower-level questions we can ask under this heading include, but are not limited to, does our code work with style and language guidelines? Does our code work with our, its latest dependencies? Does our code wor work when subjected to extreme loads? Or perhaps even, does our code work when provided malicious or otherwise invalid input? So along this, there's a broad spectrum of tests we can rely on to help us answer the question of whether or not our code works at all. So off to the left, you'll notice we have unit tests, which, generally speaking, are faster and more specific. Off to the right, we have system tests, which are slower and more comprehensive. And then in the middle, we have integration tests, which are kind of a hybrid of the two. So generally speaking, the goal of this presentation is to get you to a point where you can figure out whether or not your code works at all. We are less concerned about figuring out why it does not work, although that is something I will get to later. So along those lines, system tests are typically more essential for determining why, whether or not your code works at all. Now, unit tests can be helpful when it comes time to determine why your code doesn't work, because they give you greater granularity of what the failures are and what things are going wrong. So as a rough indication of how many, test types, how many e types of each test you need, um, on the bottom of the slide, we have a rough diagram. So imagine that you have a feature, right? And this feature is tested by one system test. So if you were to cover that feature completely with integration tests, you might need two integration tests, or perhaps even up to four unit tests to cover that feature completely. Note that these ratios are not exact. They are simply an example. So the second high-level aspect of testing that we can uh, investigate is not only does our code work, but does it work well? So static tests are a type of test that tests your code for things such as style without actually running the code. All the other tests we will talk about today involve actually running a part of your code. So load testing, uh, this is a type of system test that directly measures your code's ability to handle either expected or unexpected loads. Basically, you throw a bunch of traffic at it and see if it can handle the punishment. And then fuzz tests and vulnerability scanners uh, test your code's ability to handle malicious input. So if people try to hack your application or things like that. So as far as why we test, so testing can be thought of as an insurance policy against potential bugs and their associated business impact. So if you ever need to justify to management, well, why should we write tests? It's not so much they prevent bugs as much as it is they prevent bugs which might have a business impact on our bottom line. So the first goal of testing is to reduce the likelihood of software errors happening in the first place. The second is to verify code correctness on an ongoing basis. If you wanted to manually test your code once or twice, that's easy enough to do. The problem comes when you want to test it, say, every week or every day. After a while, the cost spent manually testing is greater than the cost of just automating it and then running an automated test suite each time you want to test it. So the stretch goal here is to quickly identify the errors caught by any tests that we have. It's not strictly necessary, but it would be helpful in the debugging process. So as far as the impact of testing, Google's OSS fuzz, uh, fuzzing project found more than 250 potential security vulnerabilities in major open source software within its first five months of execution. And inadequate software testing has been estimated to cost the United States up to 1% of its annual GDP alone. And here are the citations for those stats. <laughs> 
So now that we've talked a little bit about testing as a concept, we're going to move on to applying that to the world of functions as a service. So first off, as kind of a recap about unit tests, the core idea of a unit test is to verify that the minutiae or the individual units of your code work as expected, so things like edge case checking. Now, in a unit test, there is no reliance or verification of extra, no reliance on, excuse me, or verification of external dependencies, such as libraries, APIs, or even outright cloud platforms. But to get around this, we use mocking frameworks to fake those external dependencies. So in general, unit tests are useful for investigating known problems and things like regressions and whatnot. Uh, however, they are not as good at finding unanticipated problems that you know, kind of come out of left field. But they are fast to run and rarely use build resources. So typically, because they're self-contained, you don't have to use any actual cloud resources to run them. So they're almost cheap or free to run. And before we leave this slide, uh, there's a diagram on the bottom right hand. Uh, basically, you normally, this explains how the mocking concept works. So normally, you'd have a feature, right? And that feature calls an API. The API returns a response, and the feature does something with that response. The mocking framework allows you to completely cut the API out of the conversation and say, I'm going to return a predefined response to the feature, and I'm going to assert that the feature behaves in the way that I think it should if the API had actually returned that response to the feature. That's the core idea of unit testing. So here we have a sample HTTP Google Cloud function. Uh, this is a pretty straightforward function that essentially creates a um, creates a bucket when given a name parameter through a post request. So it will take this post request. It will attempt to create the bucket on line four using the storage.createBucket function. If that process fails, uh, it will send back an error with the error message. If it succeeds, it'll send back a success message. So here is a sample HTTP unit test. Um, You'll notice that on line one, we import a bunch of different libraries. Um, so walking through them, ProxyQuire is a really interesting library that in Node.js lets us sort of hook into or mock a, um, a client library, right? or rather a Node client library. So in this case, we have this Google Cloud slash storage client library. And we're replacing it, we're hooking it over with um, a GCS mock object, which we define on line two. Now, that GCS mock object is a sort of subset of that, of that library. And we define a create bucket function there that we want to receive any calls to storage.createBucket in our actual code. So instead of saying something like we're going to actually import the real library, we import this fake version of it, this mock version of it that we declared on line two. So once we do that, uh, we can rely on the library called signon, which gives us lots of useful helpers to log um, what kinds of arguments are being passed to functions. So you'll notice on line two, we declare something called a stub, so signon.stub. And the thing about that is that will log any arguments that are passed to it. It will log how many times it's called, things like that. And then we can inspect that stub to figure out, OK, well, how did the program that we passed the stub to actually use that stub? So then we move down to our, our test on line six. Notice that here we attempt to create a bucket. We do not actually create a bucket. So on line seven, we declare our bucket name. Uh, lines eight and nine, we declare our mock versions of request and response parameters. Uh, if you've worked with Cloud Functions before, you'll notice that, um, or seen the code previously, you'll notice that our function took those parameters, request and response. So we have to mock or fake them and pass them into our program. So once we do that, we then, do, we then uh, run, our, run our code, our, our original function, sorry, on line 10 using the program.createBucket call there. And we pass that fake request and response object into our program just as if it had been running on Cloud Functions and received the real version of those objects. And then on line 11, we check that the create bucket function, or rather our fake create bucket function, was called with the correct argument, in this case, the, the name constant. So moving on to integration tests, the core idea here is to verify that you, the various parts of your code fit together as expected. So integration tests, broadly speaking, can either use mocking or rely directly on external dependencies. Now, external dependencies that they do rely on are usually fast and or cheap to access, 
uh, thus keeping the individual test runs moderately fast, moderately quick. But note that if you're depending on actually build resources, you would have to pay for those invocations. You would have to pay for those runs. So this may require small amounts of money to run each iteration of your tests. But generally speaking, they, they balance problem detection and isolation. And this is the cool part about integration tests is that in some cases, they can detect unanticipated bugs, whereas unit tests can only detect things that you really specifically check for. Integration tests have a large enough scope that if there's some bug that happens that you haven't thought to check for, there's a better probability that integration tests will catch it. And just as a rough sort of visual analog here, uh, where an integration test comes in is let's say you have two or more features, an integration test tests their ability to sort of operate between each other. So if you have three features, you want to see how, how well they, they talk to each other, that's where an integration test will come in. Oops. And here is a sample HTTP integration test. Um, you'll notice, again, we import a bunch of libraries here, some of which are the same, some of which are not. Um, Ava is our testing harness, uh, so that's just a testing framework in, in Node. Um, UUID is a universal unique identifier library. I'll get to why that's important later. And then request promise native is a library that allows us to make HTTP requests in Node. So um, notice on line two, we have a standard Node require call. So we are importing a live version of the Google Cloud Storage library. This, this library, we are not mocking this dependency. We're importing it as is. Um, now on line four, we attempt to create a real bucket. And we do this by first declaring a bunch of values. In this case, we have to declare a name for the bucket. Uh, note that we use that UUID library that I mentioned earlier, because we want to ensure that our bucket names are unique whenever we're trying to create any actual cloud resources. If we don't, it's possible that we end up into some you know, race condition or something like that, where we try to create a bucket that already exists, or we try to delete one that doesn't exist, things like that. Um, so to avoid that, we use that UUID function there. Now, once we do that, uh, we can declare the URL of the function we want to attempt to send this request to. In this case, it's going to be a local URL. So you know, this base URL environment variable is probably going to be something like localhost or whatever. And then on line seven, we execute that HTTP request. We say, OK, here's our target URL. Let's pass a name to it, so on and so forth. Note that even when that request re returns, the bucket itself may not have yet been created. Um, so to avoid that, we have to kind of either use exponential backoff, which the idea of exponential backoff is you wait a certain amount of time, then you wait that amount of time times two, that amount of time times four, so on and so forth, constantly multiplying by some constant, or perhaps even adding some random jitter so that if you're doing a bunch of exponential backoff operations, they don't sort of all fall together. Um, but in this case, it's easy and simple enough to implement a constant delay. And that's exactly what we do on line eight. So we say we're going to wait one second between requesting that the bucket be created and actually checking if it exists, because the, the bucket creation API is eventually consistent, like a lot of cloud APIs. So we do that on line 10. We check that the, the bucket exists. And if it does, then our test passes. If it doesn't, then, well, our function didn't do what we wanted it to do, and our test fails. So moving on to system tests, uh, and kind of as a recap, note that system tests are all about verifying your code as a system. There's a heavy reliance here on external dependencies, which can slow down the test itself. And sometimes system tests will require moderate amounts of build resources, because you're directing traffic at an actual cloud instance. Now, system tests have pretty good bug detection, even if bugs are unexpected or outside your code base. This is where they really sort of show their true power. Um, if you're trying to figure out, do I have a bug in my dependencies, or is there a bug you know, perhaps in some configuration in my cloud platform, that's where system tests will hunt for that sort of thing. Uh, integration tests might find it. Unit tests probably won't find it. But system tests have a good chance of finding those types of bugs. But note that they are bad at isolating problems, generally speaking, and the root causes, just because system tests have such a large scope that they test. Uh, one thing to take away, and we discussed this in the integration tests uh, sample as well, is that state matters. And it may introduce either eventual consistency and or shared resource issues. Um, 
And what I mean by shared resource issues is if you're trying to create a resource that already exists or you're trying to delete a resource that doesn't exist, say maybe you're running two tests at the same time and they both create and delete the same test bucket, then it's possible that that will in introduce like race conditions or things like that that make your test results essentially flaky. So here's a sample HTTP system test. Uh, some of you might notice that this looks familiar. In fact, it's exactly the same as the integration test we just discussed. The only difference is the base URL that we specify. So instead of being something on our local machine or on you know, perhaps a local machine on the network, it's going to be the actual deployed cloud function URL. So it's going to be like something like US central one, some region, dash your project ID at cloudfunctions.net. Now, um, the thing to bear in mind here is the challenges of you know, those unique test runs, that state dependence, and the asynchronous nature of creating that bucket still apply. So the, those are more common in terms of system tests. Um, sometimes they happen in integration tests. Sometimes you can mock those dependencies out. But in system tests, they're almost guaranteed to happen if you're working with a cloud platform. Um, and the one caveat that I want to make sure I get to today is this system test being the same as the integration test. This is a trope you can typically exploit when you're dealing with HTTP triggered functions. If you're dealing with something like a PubSub triggered function or a Firebase triggered function or something like that, it's a lot harder to just do this and simply say my integration test and system tests are going to be identical. So moving on to static testing. So as a recap, the goal of static testing is to verify that your code follows typically either language and style conventions or dependency management best practices. Now, many of these static testing tools are free to install and quick to use. So there are two types of static testing tools that I want to make sure we talk about today, uh, the first of which is linters. And linters are really useful because they enforce style conventions uh, on your code. And sometimes they can also detect things like you know, interpretation or compilation errors. So for example, for Node, um, there's a linter linting tool called Prettier. Uh, there's also a couple different other tools, like ESLint or semi-standard that you might have heard of. If you're a Python developer, you probably know about PyLint or Flake8 or Pep8 or something like that. Um, and then dependency management tools essentially check for issues with your dependencies. So in Node, we have this tool called Sneak, which effectively checks for known insecure versions of our dependencies anywhere in our dependency tree. So let's say you depend on a package that depends on a package that is insecure. Sneak will detect that and send you an alert if you've set it up to do so. So the major con of static testing is that they have a very narrow focus. They're very good at doing what they do, but they do only do a very small amount of things. And, and as, as an example of why linting is useful, uh, you'll notice the code on the left is basically some JavaScript, some contrived JavaScript, but it's prior to linting. And then on the right, we have that code after we fix the appropriate linting errors. So on the left, basically the big issue here is uh, if you're not immediately familiar with the details of JavaScript, it might not be obvious what the value of A is. Now, someone who is, like even me, who, even a person like me who's worked with JavaScript for quite a while might think, oh, A is null, just looking at that code. But in fact, when you run it, I found out even that A is undefined. So declaring it on a separate line on the right makes it easier for other programmers to understand. Now, the other thing that the linter flagged in our left sample is that we have a double equal sign there. Now, in JavaScript, a double equal sign essentially means, can I cast A to B? Right? Not necessarily are they the same type and the same value. It's more, are they the same value, and can they be casted? So we go off to the right. We fix that because the linter says, did you really mean to just check value equality, or do you mean to check type equality as well? And in this situation, we meant to check type equality. So we add a third equal sign, and then we get that undefined and null. They might be the same value, but they are not the same type, and therefore they are not equal. And you'll notice on the left uh, that console.log statement returns true. On the right, it returns false. So this can have an impact in your code. So moving on to the idea of load testing. So the idea of load testing is to verify your entire system from end to end, including, importantly, the non-autoscaled components' um, ability to handle user demand. So here there is a heavy reliance on external dependencies. 
and these dependencies may be slow to access, which can slow down the test runs themselves. Note that a lot of load testing tools out there are typically free, or at least open source. But the test runs themselves can require lots of build resources, because essentially what you're doing is creating vast amounts of traffic and then directing it at your app. And of course, you have to pay to process that traffic. But um, load tests, generally speaking, help protect against sudden and po potentially beneficial traffic spikes. Uh, the example I like to give is, like, especially if you're in retail, uh, there are certain seasons of the year, like here in the US, it's probably like Black Friday, where retail just suddenly has a, a glut of customers. Everyone is looking to buy your product all of a sudden, right? Or perhaps you know, if you work at a small startup uh, and suddenly you know, you're your product gets featured on a major internet news site or a major newspaper, and your user base doubles by a factor of, you know, or increases by a factor of three or four or five. So how do you test that, you know, if we make it big, so to speak, sorry about that, if, if we make it big, so to speak, how are we going to make sure that our site can handle that load? Well, that's where you rely on something like a load test. And again, those, those traffic spikes can be beneficial. It need not be like a distributed denial of service or someone trying to take down your app. And some examples of load testing tools. Um, we have Apache Bench, which we're going to demo on the next slide. And that is pre-installed on most Mac and Linux systems. So you can just type AB on a terminal, and it's there. Uh, the other option is to use Apache JMeter if you want something that is more configurable. So without further ado, we'll talk about the demo. And you'll notice here we have a standard terminal. Can, everybody, can anybody not see this? Raise your hand if you cannot see this. Um, so what we're going to do, and for good measure, I'll make it a little larger. So we're going to run a, a command here that does a load test for us. So here, we're running Apache Bench. And notice what we're doing here is we're running uh, 50 requests total. So we're running 50 requests total with up to 10 requests at once, so concurrency of 10, to this link, which is just a simple HTTP Cloud function that I've set up. And importantly, if we take a look at this, these stats here, we notice that all of our requests succeeded, and none of our requests failed. So that means that we can count on this function to handle the amount of load that we've tested it to. There's also lots of other sort of interesting stats here, like you can see you know, request percentiles. Like the median request here took 81 milliseconds to complete. Uh, the longest request took maybe six seconds, which is probably due to something like a cold start or something like that. And before we get going, I'm going to execute the next step, and we'll get to that later. All right. So moving on to security testing. So to recap, the goal of security testing is to verify your code's ability to handle malicious input, and that of your dependencies as well, equally importantly. So the motivation for security testing is that US businesses lost 67 billion, with a B, to cyber attacks in 2005. That was more than 10 years ago. So security tests can occur anywhere in your testing stack. They can be part of unit tests, system tests, integration tests, and or static tests. Now, security testing tools are sometimes free to install. They're often free to install. There are some you can, you can purchase. Um, but they may cost money if build resources are involved. Like if you're testing your actual cloud deployment and you have to pay for that traffic, they send you know, potentially malicious traffic to your cloud deployment, you have to pay for that traffic. So some examples of security testing tools. Uh, there's the Open Web Application Security Project, uh, which is a great resource if you're working on like web applications. Um, and they have something called the Z Attack Proxy, or ZAP. And that is an automated testing tool that will go through your website and attempt to find uh, security vulnerabilities in your app. So then there's Sneak, which I mentioned earlier. It checks for known insecure dependencies. Uh, the big list of naughty strings. Uh, Essentially, it's a list of strings that could potentially break your app, so things like SQL injection or Unicode errors or things like that. Um, and then you have the OSS Fuzz tool that I mentioned earlier, which is written by Google. And a couple of caveats to bear in mind with security testing. If you take away nothing from this slide, this is probably the most important thing to, to take away. Um, so first of all, no automated tool is perfect. And if you're serious about security, hire a consultant. Um, they will get you closer to perfection, but they probably won't get you all the way. Um, and then 
these security testing tools may actually damage the environment that they are pointed at. Some tools are better about this than others, but if a tool, say, tries to drop your production database and you point it, or tries to drop a database rather, and you point it at your production instance and it is successful, then guess what? You've dropped your production database. So when you're dealing with security testing tools, make sure to test them in like a test environment or, or something where you know you're either. 100% confident that it is totally secure, at least from that particular security testing tool. Or if, if it gets blown up, who cares, right? Maybe you lose some test data, but you can either restore it from a backup or, you know, it's the type of thing your customers won't notice. Let me put it that way. And here's a citation for that set I mentioned earlier. So moving on to the sort of CI CD pipeline and talking about how to automate this testing process. So the core idea here is that for many developers, Git branches are the source of truth. Now, if you don't use Git, you probably use some sort of version control system, whether that's SVN or CVS or Mercurial or something like that. But the core idea is you think in terms of a version control system. And normally, function code must be tested and redeployed manually. Like in the Google Cloud Functions context, you have to do you know, your gcloud functions deploy, or you have to deploy it through the UI UI console. So to get around this, we can use uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment systems or pipelines to automate that step. Now, there are many different CI CD options available. In the context of this presentation, we will use Cloud Build primarily because it natively integrates with Google Cloud Platform and source repositories as well. And in our case, GitHub and Bitbucket. So it's, pretty, uh, it's actually pretty easy to set up a basic CI CD for Cloud Functions. It does take some time. It does take some configuration. But you, know, you could probably do it in about half a day. So here's an example build configuration for Node. Uh, this file is the heart of Cloud Build. This essentially tells Cloud Build what it needs to do to run and deploy your code, to, rather to run your tests and deploy your code. So if you're a Node developer, this will look pretty familiar. If, if you're not, then you know, we can walk through it. But essentially what's going on here with the first step is we're installing our dependencies. Uh, it's, if you've worked with Python, this will probably look like pip install to you. Now, the second test is running our tests. If you're a Python developer, this will look like pytest or nox or something like that. Um, but if you're a Node developer, you use npm test. And then third, uh, this is an optional step, but if you don't want any sort of old um, sort of zombie function instances from your old function lying around, you have to go delete it. So you can do that by doing the gcloud functions delete command. Now, if you would rather have those zombie instances around and not risk potentially deleting and not being able to deploy your function through an automated test, it's probably better just to deal with the zombie instances uh, and just nix this step. But if you care more about zombie instances than you know, potential failures on the very last step, then you probably want to include a delete command just to get rid of those zombie instances. Um, and then, of course, our last command deploys our actual uh, function code. And it's just a standard gcloud functions deploy, so on and so forth. Now, the thing to bear in mind is this executes from the top down. So if any of these steps fail, anything below them will not execute. So if your tests fail, you will not delete or deploy um, the new version of your function. Now, if the deletion succeeds, but the deployment fails, like I said earlier, you will end up without a function deployed. And if that is bad for you, if that is worse than having some old function instances lying around, we recommend nixing that third step. So now we're going to move to a demo of Cloud Build. But if we move to Cloud Build here, what we're going to do is we're going to make a change to this repo. So we're going to execute it now. Let's first take a look at the, com the commit logs here. So we notice that we have this commit here that says, we're going to change hello to hi. And maybe our manager comes to us and says, I don't like this commit. You need to get rid of it. Remove it. So we can do that using a, let me check the log again, make sure I copy the commit, git reset that commit, check our status, check our log, git reset. Let's try this, soft, there we go. Oops, that failed, so let's try something else. When all else fails, nuke it from orbit. 
And then we can push this to our master. Maybe this is a prod release, so we want to make sure that we just push it as is. pushing now. And if we take a look at the last commit, we'll notice it, it's, it's this uh, commit hash right here. And we can go to our lovely container builder, refresh it. And we notice that we've kicked off a build right here, right? So if we go there, we notice this is in response to that same git commit we just pushed, right? So we can scroll down, and we get a list of these build steps here as we define them in that cloudbuild.yaml file. So first, we're installing our dependencies. Then we're running our tests. Then we're deleting our old version of the functions. Notice the beta here, because this command is old. And then we are deploying our version of the function. Now, if we scroll down to our logs here, we notice that the build is starting. It'll take a, a second or two to kind of get going. I'm going to zoom out a little bit here so we can scroll here. So it's installing our, our dependencies here. It's executing step 0. That's, these are just sort of NPM prints. NPM logs. Then we are running our tests using NPM run integration test. And then we're starting our sort of quasi emulator, our shim, and trying to run our tests. We notice our tests are passing. Two passed, two passed. Scrolling down. So all of our tests are starting to pass here. So all of our tests have passed. Woohoo! We, we can now delete our old version of the function and we can deploy it. So as far as deleting it goes, that's what we're doing here. And it's running that deletion operation to delete the old version of the function. And then we are deploying the function here. So we've already deployed the function. And the deployment has finished, right? Now, if we go to this URL, we'll notice that before we had done this commit, if I make this larger, this used to say, hi, world, right? And our manager came to us and said, I don't want that. I want it to say, hello, world. But if we refresh it now, it says hello world as our manager asked us for. So now that we've talked a little bit about how to automate that, um, that testing process, we can talk about what to do when, you know, sort of the heavens forbid, something goes wrong and a bug ends up in production. So GCF Ops 101. Basically, the core idea here is that tests can only detect problems out of production. So for problems in production, we're going to need to do something different. And that something different is Stackdriver. So Stackdriver is a set of tools for monitoring and debugging code on GCP. Now, the most useful tools for cloud functions, in my humble opinion, are, first of all, monitoring and metrics, which help us figure out whether or not our code is broken at all. And logging and error reporting, which help us figure out where and why our code is broken. So for example, with logging and error reporting, these are pretty straightforward. Uh, logging is kind of a plug and play. It just stores and indexes logs from your function. Error reporting is also fairly plug and play. It's based off of logs. And it aggregates logs into meaningful error reports, as you can see on the right. So I know the, the font might be a little bit small, so I'll try to narrate through what's going on here. Uh, on the left, we have a sample log entry, which essentially says there is an error, uninitialized email address. Right? Now, this is in, a f in, a, in, a, in some cloud function called, as we'll see on the right, it's called on new message. So the, on the right, we have stats about how frequently this error has occurred. It was first seen 13 days ago. It was last seen six days ago. It's occurred 152 times. We have a sample stack trace and a histogram. So this is a useful command center for triaging any errors that you might have. Now, as far as monitoring and metrics go, they are not as plug and play, but they are just as, if not more, useful than logging and error reporting. So generally speaking, Stackdriver's monitoring and metrics tools help us detect production bugs quickly. They will not necessarily guarantee that you will detect production bugs, but they will increase your chances of detecting them in a timely manner. So our goal with this configuration is to catch as many errors as we can with the least setup possible. So the pros of, this conf of the configuration that we're about to talk about are that it's easy to set up, it determines if production is broken, and it can test any function type. So the cons are that it depends on logging statement coverage. So you need to basically, anytime there's an error, you need to make sure you're logging it. 
Um, and it's not always helpful for identifying the root causes of why things go wrong, or even where things go wrong. So the sort of decent configuration that you can use, this is like the, the first line of defense, if you will, against bugs in prod, uh, is to send out an alert if severe log entries, for example, errors, are too frequent, maybe more than 1% of invocations, or more than some constant, or something like that. The better option, if you have the time and sort of the engineer bandwidth, is to send out an alert if function execution time and count exceed normal limits. And note that when I say better, I recommend employing both of these. There's no harm in having additional metrics. Um, if you have to pick one or the other, it's probably better if you go with the, the first one than the second one. But having both is ideal. And some additional checks you can do, uh, if you're working primarily with HTTP triggered functions, or likewise HTTPS triggered functions, you can just use uh, Stackdriver's uptime checks to check those URLs and make sure those functions are responding with the correct, um, the correct status code. So things like you know, 200 or 302 or so on and so forth. So without further ado, we're going to do a quick demo of Stackdriver monitoring. And notice I kicked off, whoops, uh, I kicked off this command earlier. Or oops, it's not showing up. But I kicked off a command earlier that was an Apache bench command that sent, sent 10,000 requests to that cloud function that I specified earlier. Now, so if we look at our stack driver page, which is here, and we'll refresh it. So we noticed that there was a resolved inc uh, incident that was declared uh, today at about 10.55 AM. So this was an alert we got if we look at the actual sort of inbox here. We got a stack driver alert. And this was sent to us at 10.55 today. So it's telling us that our metric threshold for this cloud function was sort of violated. And it's above our threshold of 5 with a value of 37.383. So what this is telling us is, you said, send me an alert if more than five executions were happening concurrently. We had 37. So if you got something like this, you'd probably want to say, OK, well, what's going wrong with this function? Is it just suddenly super popular? Is, there some, is it some like retry loop? Is some you know, API calling it like way too many times? Like What's going on here? And of course, once you get this email, then you can follow up and investigate as appropriate. So now that we've talked about all this stuff, we can kind of recap what we've learned today. So as kind of a background of how all this works, um, or rather, we've given a background of how all this works um, and talked about sort of an overview of testing strategies in general. Then we talked a little bit about sort of applying that to the world of serverless. Finally, we talked about CI CD pipelines, um, how to automate this testing on an ongoing basis. And then a little bit about what to do when, despite our best efforts, a bug gets out of gets out of our canary or whatever in production, and we need to do something to detect that bug quickly and resolve it before, ideally before our customers notice. So the key points that I would like people to take away from this presentation, if there's a slide where you want to take a photo, this is it. Um, so narrating through this, basically testing helps detect bugs and other issues on an ongoing basis. So testing is effectively an insurance policy against potential bugs. And you know, if your managers ever ask, well, why should we write tests, the answer is they, they not only stop those potential bugs, but they stop the business impact of those potential bugs. Um, note that also there are many testing options out there that we reviewed, unit tests, function tests, system tests, uh, so on and so forth, or integration tests, system tests, so on and so forth. Um, and they all have different trade-offs in terms of accuracy, breadth, speed, and cost. Um, generally speaking, we recommend that on critical, reused, or unmaintained code, you have lots of tests with a variety of different scopes. So you're going to have a lot of unit tests, you're going to have a lot of system tests, you're going to have a lot of integration tests, maybe several static tests, so on and so forth. 
uh, on less important temporary or well-maintained code, you can usually get away with fewer higher level tests. Because generally speaking, if your code is well-maintained and you know there's a bug, you can go in and triage it pretty quickly. But if you don't know there's a bug, then there's a problem because you, you, if you don't know that the problem exists, you can't address it, right? So that's why those higher level tests are important to say, well, does my code work at all? And if my code works from end to end, then I'm reasonably confident that there isn't going to be a bug in it. Uh, but if the system tests fail, then you can say, OK, well, something's broken. I don't know what, but at least I can go deeper and take a look at it and figure out what went wrong. Now, the third, th the th third takeaway here is that Stackdriver increases your chances of de detecting production bugs quickly. Um, emphasis on increases your chances. There is no guarantee you will detect them within a certain amount of time. Um, but it's easier to detect them and more likely that you will detect them if Stackdriver is present. The broad configuration is to check for like abnormal error rates and execution times. Um, it's pretty easy to set up again. Like It would probably take a developer maybe about an hour or two at most. And finally, note that tests must address cloud-specific challenges. So the challenge of eventual consistency, you can address that using either timeouts or exponential backoff. And then the challenge of shared resources, you can address this by using temporary test environments or temporary test resources like we did with that UUID function in the system test sample. So I'd like to thank you for coming to Next today and coming to my talk. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at fast at google.com. That is the word fast with two A's. Um, otherwise, I'll be hanging around the serverless demo booth, so you're welcome to come and speak to me there. Thanks. <laughs>